All right, so welcome to part two of the Crypto Info Guide. Let's uh, just jump right into it. So uh, here's kind of the topics that this will be going over, and uh, we'll just get through this. So um, clarifications about kind of like cryptocurrency in general. Um, cryptocurrencies don't, like it, blockchains don't really allow you to do anything new. Uh, there's no extra functionality from them existing, but it does provide ease of access for using certain applications that would normally be locked behind a third party uh, with finances, payment records that you might not have access to. Um, you know, similarly, if you have any idea of like how computation works, uh, like a Turing machine is the most quote powerful machine that we can really build. And even though we've made significant advances in uh, how we are able to construct computery machinery, um, we aren't really able to solve any new classes of problems. So, you know, cryptocurrency doesn't allow you to do, it, to do anything that the normal private industries already give you access to. Okay? So, uh, you know, if it seems like uh, when people present um, these use cases for cryptocurrencies, it's like, well, you could just do the same thing with a bank. It's like, yes. Exactly. <laughs> it's, you know, so don't worry about that. So, uh, for basics, so everyone knows where we're starting off, blockchains have this security mechanism called proof of work. Um, if you've ever read anything about cryptocurrency at all, you already know this. So, you know, if you don't, you can just read the Bitcoin white paper, which goes over the exact security mechanisms in far more detail. But basically, there's a computational workload that's associated with producing new blocks onto the blockchain. Okay. Um, you know, if you put it in another way, uh, let's say I record this entire video without splits, and at the end of the video, I roll a D20, and it will only be considered a successful video if I roll a 20. So I'd have to do, on average, 20 recordings to get a video that would be considered acceptable. So I would have a 20-fold increase in the amount of time it would take to produce one successful take. So, you know, you can imagine that if we put this requirement on to say like every single YouTuber and a person wanted to make like a 10 minute video, well, they would have to do 200 minutes worth of recording in order to have one successful take out of it on average. So, you know, if you put this requirement onto people, you could, you know, greatly limit the amount of content people produce because, you know, functionally, you could only produce like 1 20th of a day's worth of content every day. So, you know, you couldn't actually have a person that could put out more than like an hour and a half of content in a day. So in hashing, this dice roll function that we have is called a cryptographic hash function. So it takes an input and produces a pseudo random output. So the output is as good as random, but the same input will always produce the same output. So if we're both given the same input and we both know what the hash function is, we should both arrive at the exact same output after we do all this math associated with this cryptographic hash function. And these are supposed to be incredibly chaotic functions, um, such that even modifying a singular bit uh, will completely change the output in absolutely unpredictable ways. So if anything changes, you have to redo the entire computation. There's no shortcuts. There's no way of arriving at a solution that you want. You know, there's a solution you want. You basically just have to do it over and over and over again with different inputs. So for Bitcoin, the number you're looking for has a long string of zeros at the start. Uh, for Bitcoin mining, you have a set input and then add an extra number at the end, which is modified. So if the output of the hash function is now the result you want, you modify that extra number called a nonce and try again. And then uh, try, try, and try again on the order of trillions, of trillions of times. You know, just unbelievable amounts of times. So uh, all this computation requires computation resources. So you don't care about the computation power. 
that's not important. You only care about the market rate of computation versus the expected payout at that market rate. For example, if I'm able to spend a hundred bucks on a graphics card, which also eats a buck a day in electricity, if my expected payout over a hundred days of using it was two hundred dollars in crypto, then after you consider the electricity cost, my purchase has effectively paid for itself in a hundred days. So if this seems like a good investment, more people are going to buy graphics cards to do the exact same thing, and that'll push the price of the cards up due to the open market, because there's not infinite supply. Uh, we can only produce these types of electronics so quickly. There's only so many manufacturers of them. So, you know, now that we've pushed the price up, now I can get the same card for $200, and now it takes 200 days to pay off. So if it still seems like a good investment, then more people are going to do the same thing and its price is going to go up due to market adjustments. So when does this become a bad investment? So what is the classification between a good investment and a bad investment? And why would people continuously pump money into these systems? So for general investing, uh, there are things called market indexes, which is basically uh, uh, a conglomeration of a whole class of assets that people think maintain value very stably, okay? Um, so on a long enough timeline, a market index, you know, like this is like the S&P 500 or like the Dow Jones Industrial Average, uh, those are like the two really common ones people hear about. There's a whole bunch more though, but a market index roughly doubles in value about every 10 years, and that's, you know, calculating that that's about 7% per year on average of gains and you know if you're a pessimist you you know five percent per year which is doubling every 14 years so uh this has pretty much been true for the last 140 years so uh you know if it doesn't continue to be true in the future that would be a pretty dramatic shift from uh historical records you know, in general, if there is anything that maintains a stable value because we inflate money over time, uh, if it doesn't gain about like what, like 40% value over like 10 or 15 years, uh, you know, you effectively have just lost value due to inflation because there's more money in the system available. So index funds are not the strongest investments but they are risk-free and idiot-proof, so they're recommended to everyone, and yes, I just called everyone an idiot. So crypto mining has to be reliably worse than an index fund, because these are the safest investment structures around. So let's assume if we aren't yielding at least 20% year-over-year growth, it's bad and not worth the risk and work. So, you know, if you do anything, it takes work, and if you're doing anything risky, if something doesn't go correctly, uh, you're going to have to deal with that bad for unfortunate outcome. So, but you know, sometimes there's risk, but it's fine because the payout can be really strong. So statistically, still makes a good investment. You know, if you do nothing wrong and you still lose, that's not uh, failure, that's life. You know, do nothing wrong, you know. So let's also think of the extra costs associated with mining. So let's assume that after one year, the hardware we buy halves in value on the second-hand market. And let's assume that for every $1 of computation hardware, uh, it also costs a dollar of extra stuff that can't be easily sold. So this would be like your cables, your office racks, servers, switches, internet connections, um, you know, maybe like a worker or something. So now what do our costs work look like? So what does the annual or daily yield for mining need to be to justify this investment over the safest option available? So if we're going into the mining market, we're looking for a 25% year-over-year growth on our investment. So let's solve it out. So after a year, we spend a buck on hardware, a buck on extras, and then we sell off the hardware for 50 cents. So that's our 25% return. So then we would need to be mining a dollar for every dollar spent on hardware. 
So the card I currently have, the RX 580, can mine $3.30 per day after electrical costs, or around $1,200 per year. And that was at the current crypto market rates and mining difficulty on uh, May 16th. So that was like two, three weeks ago when I put this slide here. So if the card costs less than 1200 bucks, being a crypto miner beats investing in a standard index with at least 25% year-over-year gains. However, the current market value of an RX 580 is somewhere between like 600 and 800 bucks. That's what you can buy it for off of, you know, uh, like Amazon or some other website. So in this case, either hardware prices increase, because this is a really strong investment at these rates. Uh, mining difficulty doubles, which is very unlikely because that would require twice as much hardware to be allocated to this. And you know, simply doubling that is gonna be a little bit difficult at this point. Or uh, the crypto market crashes. So uh, of course, um, uh, you could say it crashed a little bit. So, uh, two weeks later, on 527, the same card now generates, uh, you know, about two bucks a day after electrical costs. So, given the cost assessments and risk conditions for meeting at least 25% year-over-year growth, uh, the target price point for the RX 580 card is $700, which is, you know, about the current market price of that graphics card. You know, but this is your localized equation. So the world is a global thing. Costs aren't equal everywhere. For example, electricity and component costs vary depending on where you live. Um, so keep in mind, for a market to work in a globalized economy, it doesn't have to be profitable where you are. It only has to be profitable for someone somewhere. And to keep in mind that somewhere is going to impact your prices and viability of your business ventures. Just like, as long as there are extremely undeveloped parts of the world, plastic will remain recyclable, even though it basically largely isn't at any sort of reasonable market rate. So, is electricity cost even something we should consider? So, a space heater and a server, you know, under some circumstances, they actually are the same thing. So the most efficient format for heating, uh, you know, for transferring heat into a space is something we call a heat pump, which is an air conditioner, but backwards. So if you're using electrical heating, like a, you know, an electrical heater, um, your competition in that space would be a heat pump. So that's what you're having to deal with. So, hi, welcome to Technology Connections. Today we're going to talk about Heat pumps. By the wonders of using a working fluid known as a refrigerant, it's possible to compress and liquefy a gas to generate heat in one area, pump the liquid to another area, and evaporate it to absorb heat or provide cooling in another area, like the outside of your home. Heat pumps have an efficiency of about 400%. So for every one joule of electricity used in your home, or used, your home is heated with four joules of heat. However, heat pumps have a variable efficiency, depending on circumstances, and sometimes are only as good as resistive or electric heating solutions, which have an efficiency of only 100%. So how do you heat your home? So when heat pumps are no better than resistive heating solutions, uh, there is no penalty for using resistive heating solutions. And also keep in mind, not everyone has a heat pump installed inside their house, like my house doesn't have one, so, you know, I would have to actually go out and purchase a heat pump if I actually wanted to deal with these, or get these efficiency gains for heating. So, you know, but resistive heating is literally doing nothing. Okay, if you turn on an electric heater, all it does is just burn electricity to produce heat. So, instead, you could go turn on your TV. You could turn on every light bulb in your house. You could run your stereo. You could play League of Legends. You could leave your refrigerator open. So all of these would generate heat with resistive heating, but actually do something useful, like generating entertainment, light, noise, salt, or mold, respectively. 
So if you ran your computer as a crypto miner to heat your home when heat pump efficiency drops to around 100%, you only waste a little bit of electricity, but you get the benefit of scraping money off the internet. Okay, so if you're resorting to resistive heating, you literally cannot waste electricity. All right, so you need to understand you cannot waste electricity. If you turn a heater on, you could be doing anything else with that electricity other than turning that heater on. Literally anything you do is going to be better because it's going to at least do something. Heaters are the only electrical use case that actually has zero utility value for like for utilizing electricity. Um, so if you're if you're using resistive heating, you can do something else with that electricity and actually get some sort of useful benefit out of it. So basically, what I'm saying, okay, is install a bunch of crypto miners which produce heat in your basement or garage. Then you can use a heat pump to cool and dehumidify your basement and heat your house. So it, there are heat pumped water heaters, which are kind of like a perfect application for this. So you literally take waste heat from your computation servers and use your water tank as a thermal battery. And if you have something like, uh, what, like radiative heating, like through a, you know, like old houses have a recirculating hot water system, uh, that hot water system can be heated through a heat pump and be circulating all that hot water through the structure. Um, the Baguda, what if I live in uh, Boilerberg uh, in Arizona on the fucking sun? Um, so I would recommend not running more devices that consume electricity. So if you live in a hot climate area, every unit of heat you generate is an additional unit of heat that your air conditioner has to pump out of your home. So mining in a hot area, instead of getting home heating for free, essentially doubles your electricity cost. You know, if you want to maintain your, you know, a reasonable living temperature. So, uh, you know, what a lot of the FUD about Bitcoin is, and crypto in general, is its electricity uh, consumption, which is a problem, but is like how big of a problem is this in comparison to other things so you know it's estimated that cryptocurrency eats about 0.55 percent of global electricity like how accurate is this it's really hard to judge actually but this is an estimate you know like it's what people think okay you know this could be off by a factor of two in either direction so you know that might so you know, this is a number. So that electricity might actually be used for people heating their homes. Like, you know, when I was mining crypto, uh, in the winter time, it was just a nice way to keep my, uh, my room warm. It was, it was pretty convenient. So, so it, it, this might be excess grid energy from, re from renewables or geothermal, like in Iceland, which isn't really concerning. Um, but honestly, most of the mining occurs in China, and most of China's electricity is generated from coal. And then there are people that are literally making uh, the business of crypto mining their job. So they aren't actually getting any of the extra efficiency gains from, uh, you know, using it for some, like using all that waste heat for some actual useful purpose, like, you know, heating a structure or keeping something warm. So... Uh, you know, not exactly the ideal efficient use of resources. So, is 0.55% of global electricity a lot? So, the U.S. banking sector, because that's kind of like Bitcoin's or, you know, uh, cryptocurrencies competition. So, the U.S. banking sector employs about 1.85 million people. So... You know, in comparison, from whatever numbers I was able to Google, um, the Indian National Banks employ, you know, 0.55 million people, and Indian private banks employ 0.45 million people, and other stats say there are 14 lakh employed. I don't know what a lakh is. Apparently, it's like 100,000. And that apparently, so, uh, you know, other statistics say there's like 1.4 million Indians employed in the banking sector. 
So anyways, this is like our range of uh, banking sector employment numbers. You know, here's here's a range. India is about 0.1% of the population, and the US is about 0.5% of the population. So if electricity consumption is evenly distributed per person, you'd expect 1% of the population to consume 1% of the electrical supply. So if the, global if the global usage of electricity is lower for cryptocurrencies than the population proportion of the banking sector, cryptocurrency is a more efficient format of banking in transactions. Huh. So, you know, because we could, in theory, you know, this is like the way a five-year-old thinks about how you can make things more efficient by killing all the old people that don't do anything anymore. Uh, we could just kill off all the bankers and save the resources we expend on keeping them alive. So, of course, this is a false equivalence that ignores the tasks that are exclusive to either banks or crypto. And it's not like crypto doesn't also employ people, and it's not like the banks don't also use electricity. Um, and banks do use electricity, and they use a lot of it. So Bitcoin uses 113 terawatt hours per year, or 0.55% of global usage. Banks, on the other hand, use 260 terawatt hours per year, or 1.26% of global usage, and also employ between 0.1 to 0.56% of humanity. So, you know, all the sources I've provided have questionable accuracy. I don't know how accurate they even are. But even if they're all off by like 50% in favor of the banks, uh, cryptocurrency is still pretty competitive from an energy usage standpoint. You know, mining and computation have other uses. And now that we have a market for figuring out how valuable uh, compu like computation time is on an open market, now we can have access to a different class of computation. So one of these is as a spam filter. So I have an email account, and I hate everyone, uh, but unfortunately communication is an important part of the humanity experience, so I can't block you all. So every email I receive, I hash. If the hash is not a rare enough value, same way you would look at, like, say, a newly mined block, um, I throw away the message. So I might send an email back to the sender telling them to try harder, you know, send me a new message and maybe it'll hash to a more, to a value that I actually like. So if you send me an email, when I hash the mes message in the email, which includes my email address and maybe like a timestamp, so you can't just send like a same email to like 10,000 people, you know, I expect it to hash to a very rare value. This requires you, the sender, to proof of work the email before you send it by adding a nonce. And this forces you, the sender, to spend computation resources basically mining the email you're going to send before you even send it. So what is the point of doing this. So bot or spam servers might send out a few million, uh, billions of emails a day. Um, so if I require about a minute of your computation time for me to receive an email from you, I can effectively completely eliminate spam from your bot if you're running one. Because if you're sending out a billion emails a day, then you need a billion minutes of computation time and the machine, or maybe cluster of machines you're working with, can really only manage like 10,000 minutes of machine time per day. So, you know, if contacting me isn't worth the half a cent to three cents it would cost you in computation resources, I can't imagine that you're contacting me with any good intention. Because it's like, oh, well, I'd contact you, but I can't bother to spend a penny to do that. It's like, motherfucker, you'd throw, that, throw that dime down. It's not that much. Like, are you kidding me? So, this could introduce a small delay of up to a few minutes as your computer works, but known email addresses can always be whitelisted to ignore this requirement. So, you know, if I, I really gotta talk to you about your car warranty, dude, it's super important. Uh, you know, go burn two cents before you talk to me. You know, show me what my time is worth to you, you know, slave. Uh, you know, just... You know, convincing other people that they should burn their money first in order to initiate anything. Uh, you know, but does this actually introduce a delay? Because 
you know, mining takes machine time. So if there's like a minute on average worth of delay associated with doing anything, then, you know, rapid communications might start faltering as you might, you know, on average it's a minute, but you might be waiting for three or five to do anything, and that might be considered unacceptable. So instead of adding a nonce to the message directly, let's instead take a hash of the message and include that in a data block to be proof of worked instead. So you can mine the entire uh, container that contains the hash of the message plus some extra data plus a nonce. So until you get a rare enough result and then provide this packet of data to the email server along with the message to verify the integrity of the sent message. So doing it this way allows you to outsource the proof of work process to a third party without sharing the message itself. And that extra data can include like a miner's payment information, like a name or crypto address, maybe like a timestamp associated with it that other people could use, um, you know, just whatever else people would want to add. And then a middleman can then verify that the requested hash is rare enough, pay the miner, so you provide something to this other service, this other service recruits a whole bunch of miners, uh, the miners go mine the block, send it back to whatever middleman is holding all this stuff to verify everything, verify it all, they pay the miner from your holdings, and they provide you with the data block. So that might be confusing, so here, let's go an example. So there's a message like, hey Steve, I want to talk to you about an exciting offer about your car warranty. That would be the message. So you take this message, run it through a hash function, you get a hash, and then you send that code off to the mining service, and then that code, or that hash, is included in a mess, like in a data block with some extra uh, information associated with it, along with like that nonce value. And then it's mined a whole bunch of times where the nonce value will change until it's finally an acceptable value and the hash is considered correct. And then you have this extra data block. So what do you do at this point? Well then you take your original message and then you take that mined data block and you send them both to the recipient. So then the recipient receives both these two blocks. The recipient hashes the original message to get the hash value of that message they compare the two value they compare the two values so the hash of the value or the hash of the message and then in this data block this hash will be included somewhere in it so they can see that this message is related to this block and that it has been properly mined you know it's mined to here okay you do the hash of this data block and then you get a new hash value and then you see like yes this hash is considered rare enough because there's a bunch of leading zeros. So in this market you can simply connect your computer as a hashing agent for a third party and wait to receive hashes of messages to mine and then send the mined messages back and get paid. So this allows an entire mining market to develop as users submit messages be mined with higher bids for faster turnover. So meanwhile if you're a miner providing your computer resources for this type of service, you can set a minimum allowable rate. So if the payment bid isn't high enough for the hashing difficulty, you just ignore it. And as they say, it's not worth your time. So users on low power devices can then outsource this work to high power devices. So you might have, say, like a dollar worth of uh, money being held by one of these like third party services that manage all that manage the uh, outsourcing of this stuff. And then like when you want to send an email with your phone, uh, you know, you just send a message off to the third party and say like, hey, I need this mined real quick, here's five cents. And then they'll outsource it to say like, you know, 50 different people. And then they'll all start mining it. And within like say 15 seconds, you can get your block returned. So even though you're using like a phone or something, uh, you can still have very fast turnover. In this way so uh, and then you don't have to do Turing tests to check if people are bots anymore so captcha and things like it keep bots out but they do very little to stop an army of criminally underpaid workers in foreign countries from solving them instead 
So if you don't know about the incredible uh, outsourced work, which is basically uh, people outsourcing Turing tests, um, like, uh, yeah, it's, it's pretty interesting. But uh, we're trying to get rid of those. But how do you do that? Because it's like, hey, we need to solve eight million kapschkas it's like all right well you know i'm not going to do that so i'll just pay like you know 35 people in vietnam you know to do that instead because i can pay them like a dollar a day <laughs> it's it would never be worth it for anyone here in america to solve because there's like a minimum wage that's pretty you know comparatively really high so um, you know, so we can use all this proof of work stuff to uh, do what we've always done and replace a criminally underpaid workforce with a machine that can't file OSHA complaints. So, you know, uh, not sure if anything like this has been made yet, but, you know, might make a good programming project for forum software, or maybe like a browser plugin or like a mail plugin or something. Um, yeah. Uh, would anyone actually use this? I don't know. But it seems like a pretty reasonable idea for trying for like an anti-botting uh, system. So forum anti-spam, but you can do the same things for posting on forums to keep the botters out. Uh, so when you make a forum post, you mine it to include a nonce to make sure to make the forum post hash to a suitably rare value. Then users could also be selectively whitelisted to ignore this requirement, in like auto moderator on Reddit. So, unless you're regularly posting on the forum, uh, like, every minute of the entire day, this should never affect you. You know, like, uh, if you make, like, 8,000 Reddit posts a day, you know, like, you know, you'll be harmed in this. But I think no reasonable person makes more than, like, 30 Reddit posts a day. Uh, you know, unless it's, like, a very strange day on the internet for you. So unless you're regularly posting on the forum like every minute, this should never affect you. Meanwhile, bots and user farms that post thousands of times per day are basically squelched uh, unless their owners are wasting what amounts to a few dollars a day worth of computation resources. Because there's an open market for computation resources, you could either be trying to post on a forum that requires you to burn a little bit of your computation time, or you could take that computation time and simply go mine cryptocurrency instead. So that's your opportunity cost at work. So, you know, in very poor places, that type of exchange might not really be worth it anymore. If they could post on a forum for free, they would do that all day as basically spam vectors for advertising companies to try to like put a, you know, to create like a grass or a false grassroots movement to like promote a product or something or like get a company name, uh, you know, like upvoted to infinity or like you know writing uh reviews for some type of product on amazon or something or like maybe just liking a facebook post or something you know, who knows there's a whole lot of things that uh you know people do to promote things in ways that i think you should probably consider to be unethical so, you know, this tiny cost requirement effectively prices out the lower half income bracket of humanity from uh, spamming your form or email. But uh, why is this important? So, uh, you know, criminally underpaid people in foreign countries, kind of annoying, but the, the one thing that's definitely coming is AI. So AI bots are getting better, smarter, faster, and more creative than you. Uh, this might not be true yet, but just wait. So back in the day, scams cost scammers their time and they had to know and speak good English. So at like 12 bucks an hour, it costs the company one cent to keep someone on the phone for three seconds. So if you can just waste like two minutes of an American spam caller's time, you've basically cost that company like, you know, a quarter. So an outsourced worker might have a wage of like less than two bucks an hour. So, with lower baseline costs, there's increased availability of a resource, which is great for something like more potatoes. Uh, bad for spam. 
So if you think scams are bad right now, and that your car warranty is really important, um, you know, just wait 10 years when proper next gen or even the next next gen version of uh, AI software becomes widely available to really destitute individuals who can easily make more from one properly executed scam than they would working for an entire year. You know, unfortunately, there is still incredible wealth disparity uh, globally, and uh, people or will try to exploit that. So by forcing the owners of these AI scam bots into baseline costs just to contact someone or do anything, um, you can effectively price them out of scam profitability. You know, but why stop there? Why not add in a baseline computation cost for liking a post or retweeting or an upvote or a downvote or a reaction emoji? Why not add a computation cost to everything we consider free on the internet? Because free is asking to be overrun with bots and extreme power users that spam promote themselves in the absence of moderation. So, you know, consider Facebook, Twitter, and Reddit. Uh, you might not think so, but bots really do kind of rule these places. Uh, you might not say, like, there's not a lot of bots, but there's certainly enough to cause a lot of problems. So, spam filters can remove about, you know, 99% of spam. So, if you've gone through Twitter or something, uh, what's remaining is what hasn't been filtered out, and 99% of the annoyance has already been filtered out, and they're still overrun with spam. So, like, if they just added the tiniest bit of costs, um, that would, like, this is a spam filter that works indiscriminately of whatever type of like AI system they're trying to do to keep the bots out. So, uh, you know, but one of the problems is like, what is a proper cost? Like, what is the correct amount of fee to associate with allowing a person to use a platform? And that thing that I have a couple videos on, OmegaNet, is what solves that math problem. And uh, it's subjective. And I'll cover that later whenever I do that, you know. So, you know, what a shitty future. Um, AI is coming and there eventually won't be a free filter that can keep them out like CAPTCHA. So anti-bot tests like CAPTCHA uh, need to be simple enough that the idiot... Er, so anti-bot tests need to be simple enough that the biggest idiot can pass it, yet good enough that the best AI cannot. So there's the lowest bar of humanity and the highest bar of AI. And they need and like they need to be separated. If they cross over each other, then your uh, spam filter no longer works because you're literally filter filtering out people now. So, you know, unless you can make the tests like is super convoluted, so such that like no AI can reasonably deal with it. Um, but that's going to take a lot of work on a regular user to solve as well. Uh, you could just ask for proof of work, you know, just spend like a minute of your computation time, and then you can go through it that way. So, you know, what is computation actually worth? So, you know, there's a lot of questions about this. What should computers be priced at? You know, like, is a graphics card a reasonable value right now? Uh, what should we visualize the cost of computation as actually being? Like, how much is a single hash of something worth? Uh, how much are these magic rectangles we hold in our pockets actually worth? You know, like, these little phone things. Um, you know, little magic bricks. Uh, who knows? You know, are graphics cards unreasonably priced? Or is this the price they should have always been? You know, how underutilized has computation been? Like, how valuable is a user on the internet? You know, like, Facebook has, you know, effectively 7 billion users, and they're priced at, you know, their stock valuation is like, what, $100 billion or something? So does just having a user mean that that's worth, like, 10 bucks, 15 bucks? You know, like, what is, <laughs> what is that? So, beats me, I honestly have no idea. Uh, that's what open markets attempt to solve by correctly pricing things. But, you know, I, I will say that if the market rate was $20,000 for a computer, I'd pay it.
and don't lie you would too uh, good thing they only cost like a thousand bucks though so now there's like the other types of computation resources so some people host you know, it's your dog this is this is a new dog the other dog is he got too old and had to he had to go away no so some people host machines that do computation for free so uh, those are gone because people uh, because they can be used to make money um, so if you've ever been to the it runs doom subreddit it's amazing because they get doom to run on just the most ridiculous things you would never think of like controllers and <laughs> like, you know it runs doom that's the challenge can it run doom so think of that but with crypto miners like can it crypto and just try to get crypto miners running literally everything so any type of free or hackable resource is going to have some creative genius trying to get a crypto miner to run on it so any website app game or software can have one running in the background uh, sure, doing this will only produce fractions of a cent per day while burning your electricity battery and lagging hundreds of users trying to use an online resource, but that's not important. Someone gets paid for free, and uh, so, you know, I kind of expect there to be a large-scale exploit on smart fridges or something, you know, just some dumb thing, and uh, you know, someone puts like a crypto miner in your fucking smart fridge. <laughs> <laughs> you know, but you know, here here was something really funny I thought up. Uh, so the truly creative might eventually realize that they could just dig a burrow underneath a high voltage transmission line, uh, put up loops of wires to induction siphon electricity to power a crypto miner, and connect the miner to the internet with a mobile or a satellite connection and then uh, bury it underground so no one can find it. So you literally have a buried treasure miner. Um, you know, would anyone do this? I don't know. But now that there's market incentive for stealing electricity, I assume it's probably going to happen eventually. Uh, maybe it already did, I don't know. So I'm kind of waiting for a news article to break about it so I can get that feeling of simultaneous like pride and disappointment in humanity that you, uh, you know, rarely get until you see something it's just like, oh, that's beautiful, but I, why would you do that? <sighs> so, if you don't know, uh, high voltage transmission lines using um, alternating current produce really large magnetic fields. If you put up loops of wire, the magnetic field induces an electrical current in that wire, and that's how you steal the electricity. Literally just holding a loop of wire near... Uh, yeah, an HVAC system um, can heat it up. Okay, so uh, some people actually did this back in the day to sell electricity to wholesalers. Um, but the difference is that doing that was really easily detectable because they could just go to your installation, see that you put up loops of wire all around your fence or something, and then see that the meter was going backwards. And it's like, so you want to explain this? <laughs> So, an underground mining installation that did this would be really, really difficult to detect because there wouldn't need to be any connection to the actual grid in order to get paid from the system. Like you would literally just bury everything underground. So, uh, you know, shouldn't need to really state the obvious, but this is uh, very illegal, most likely. So, is this presentation even about crypto anymore? That's a good question, because uh, I kind of went off the rails. Uh, yes, because, you know, crypto has finally opened up a free market for computation resources. So we've had private markets for computation provided by cloud services, uh, but now we have an open free market that anyone can join at any time with extremely little overhead. So, you know, cloud services are not going away. Random netizens can't provide the same type of resources offered by cloud services. We simply have access to a new class of computation resources to add implied cost not do useful work. So this is still valuable even though it adds functionally nothing. I know, it's kind of like the plumage on Birds of Paradise. For example, um, this is an American embassy in Ghana. 
Uh, people have picked up their passport here for a decade. Here's a news article about it if you want to check my source. I don't know why you would need to, though. This is clearly an American embassy. I mean, look, it's got street-side parking, an electrical connection, presumably security, a gate, like everything you need at an embassy. So, if something about the state of this embassy is bothering you, ask yourself why. Obviously, I'm lying. So, on the right is the actual embassy, but that didn't stop scam artists from finding the right people to scam and saying their mixed-use basement dwelling is officially representing one of the richest nations in the world. So, being expensive actually does imply credibility. Uh, and then charity dinners, kind of the same thing. $10,000, anti-poor person to feed it. Keep other people out. Uh, you know, if you're there, anyone you talk to is probably going to have a, you know, a great person to form a business connection with because they're probably extremely wealthy. Uh, and then it's a math, and if you make a hundred million bucks a year, a ten thousand dollar fee is the same as putting guacamole on your burrito at Chipotle if you make fifteen bucks an hour. Interesting. Uh, well, this was depressing. What the fuck, Gouda? Well, I don't know. Sorry. Uh, conclusion: I don't know. World's changing. Um, you know, a lot of the stuff hasn't been built yet. Maybe it has. I don't know. I can't search the entire world. So, if you did find something in this presentation interesting, uh, maybe it would make a good programming project. So, if you do plan on building or renovating a house, maybe you'll want to look into how you can manage home heating by exploiting computation resources. So, uh, you know, heat your home for effectively free, and, or it still costs you money to heat your home, but you also garner uh, payment out of it for basically just heating an area. So, uh, yeah, that's it. Will there be a part three? I don't know. But, uh, you know, if you have any questions or something, you know, post them in the comments. All the set of slides will be uh, linked in the description. Uh, yeah, so I'm Gouda, and I will see you next time.